Alien students, and welcome to episode 12B of Mind Altering Substances in the Ancient World. I'm your host, as usual, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are starting a three part series that is a deep dive into the economic processes underlying one of the most prevalent mind altering industries in the ancient Mediterranean, and that, of course, is the wine industry. So, so far in this course, we've tended to look at how mind altering substances intersect with things like religion and medicine and even kind of politics to an extent. Uh, but our investigation into the economic structure of the wine industry will show us how widespread the engagement with wine actually was, not just at the dinner table, but also when it comes to farming and shipping and selling wine. By the time we get done with these uh, three modules, focused on production today, distribution next module, and consumption in the third module, you'll be able to head into Napa Valley as an expert and let them know how things really were in the good old days when men were emperors, women were priestesses, and the wine flowed like the blood of Bacchus himself. So join me today as we dive into wine production in the ancient Roman world. So you learned in the last lecture that the origins of Rome date back to 753 BC, when Romulus founded the city on top of the Palatine Hill. We're going to start today by going back much, much further and look at the origins of wine more broadly. And when we're talking about this, what we're talking about is viticulture. So take that as the all-encompassing term to denote the production and study and science of wine and grapes. And those grapes, for the Latin inclined, are known as vitis vinifera in the scientific binomial nomenclature. Now when we think of the geography of wine in the modern world, we tend to think of places like Bordeaux in France or Tuscany in Italy, regions of the old world justifiably famous for their high quality purple beverage. But the origins of wine production are actually nowhere near the old heart of the Roman Empire. Instead, we need to travel eastward to China, where a team of archaeologists discovered the early evidence for wine at the site of Jiahu in 1995. This site dates back to around 7,000 BC, 9,000 years ago, and there we have evidence for ceramic vessels that contained a variety of alcoholic beverages, rice wine and mead, and kind of most importantly for us, grape wine. And these chemical analyses were supplemented with the discovery of grape pits themselves. And from then, we learned that the earliest version of wine was more like a cocktail, mixed with honey and tree resin to Im improve both flavor and preservation. Our early evidence for actual straight-up grapes-only wine comes from Georgia. And no, no, not the southern state with Atlanta, but rather the eastern European country. Actually, it's almost as far from Italy as, you know, our Georgia is from Italy as well. Anyway, uh, our evidence for wine from Georgia also comes in the form of chemical analyses. And here we think the wine was drank straight and unmixed, much like it is today. The vessels used for this analysis are also of interest. They're massive and bulky, and kind of weirdly, they can't stand upright. They were likely either put on a stand or buried in the ground. And the same vessel, kind of due to its size and weight, it was about 300 liters, was likely used both for fermentation and for storage, and probably even served out of. Well, maybe at least Italy's got the oldest wine production facility. No, not at all. It doesn't have that either. Uh, the honor of the world's oldest winery belongs to Armenia. In a cave known as Areni I, because it's near the town of Areni, the entire wine production facility was found dating back to around 4100 BC, over 6,000 years ago. And that facility contained everything you need to enjoy wine. A wine press, jars for the fermentation process, serving vessels, drinking cups, and I guess you can kind of see like where the Kardashians make more sense now knowing that they come from a long tradition of Armenian party wine culture. So what's up with all this early wine? Were ancient civilizations just a bunch of drunkies? Uh, shouldn't they have spent their time, you know, inventing like important things, kind of like writing or architecture or whatever, uh, instead of something only slightly less useful, kind of like wine? Uh, but the answer is probably it wasn't a conscious invention. It's not like they were spending time inventing this. More likely, wine came about after people just left grape juice sitting out. Basically, you need two things to make something alcoholic. You need sugar and yeast. And grapes naturally have both of those. The sugars are inside of the grape, right? Play, a thing we call the must, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then the yeasts exist on the skin of the grapes. So when the grapes are mashed up, the yeasts turn into sugars, uh, turn the sugars into alcohol, and presto changeo, you got yourself wine. Let's start moving towards Rome, though. Italy, too, has been in the news kind of pretty recently in terms of early wine production. Up until about a year ago, most scholars thought that wine production in Italy started somewhere in the Middle Bronze Age, around 1300 BC for uh, the Italian peninsula. Uh, 
But recent excavations at Monte Cronio near Agrigento on the island of Sicily have turned up possible evidence of much, much older wine storage. Chemical analyses on the Copper Age storage jars, dating to the early 4th millennium BC, show evidence of tartaric acid and sodium salt, both of which could indicate the presence of wine. Nonetheless, the over 2,000 year time gap between these finds and the kind of traditionally accepted first evidence of wine in Italy is a pretty large one. And it's likely that more evidence is needed to conclusively determine whether winemaking went all the way back to the Copper Age in Italy. What we do know is that winemaking in Italy predated the founding of Rome itself. In the Etruscan culture, the advanced precursor to Roman culture located primarily in modern day Tuscany, commonly grew grapes and made wine. And we can see this uh, in the archeological remnants of how important kind of wine was in Etruscan society. Often what we find are the kind of ceramic vessels used in the wine production, storage, and serving process. And here what we're looking at is a crater or wine mixing bowl where you would mix water and wine to kind of reduce the alcohol content. And these very nicely preserved ones are often the result of these being buried as grave goods in Etruscan tombs. As Rome grew, it ended up coming in contact with all sorts of other cultures who already had long and storied histories of viticulture. So the Etruscans we just talked about, the Carthaginians in North Africa, and especially the Greeks. For hundreds of years, Greek wine was famous as being the best around. And it was only in the late Republic that Rome, Roman viticulture overtook its Greek predecessor. And interesting, this is somewhat like a common trend in Rome, where Rome, Romans always think that everything Greek is better than everything Roman. Architecture, art, philosophy, drama. And so you can just kind of add wine as one more thing to that list. Our sources about wine production in the ancient Roman world are both archaeological, meaning the stuff from the ancient world, and historical, meaning the texts from the ancient world. And the oldest text we have comes not from Greece, not from Rome, but actually from Rome's enemy, Carthage. And this was written by Mago prior to Rome's sack of the city in the Third Punic War in 146 BC. Mago's work was one of the few Carthaginian texts to survive the Punic Wars. And Roman writers thereafter used this treatise as a basis for their own work on viticulture. And while we don't have Mago's actual text left, we have snippets of that text in Greek and Latin sources that drew upon his work. One of his big takeaways was, if you're going to start a vineyard in the countryside, you better go ahead and sell your city house because there is so much work that there's no time for your divided attention. And my guess is that vintners today would feel very much the same way. The Romans also had their fair share of writers who discussed how to successfully grow and harvest uh, grapes and turn that harvest into wine. And the first and arguably the most influential was Cato the Elder. Cato was a Roman senator, provincial governor, and a harsh opponent of Carthage. But in his free time, he was also a writer. And one of his most important famous works was called De, Agri De Agricultura, concerning the culture of the field, very literally, or more simply, about agriculture. Cato's De Agricultura is a treatise on how to run a farm, what to grow, when to grow it, where to grow it, how to staff the farm, how to get the most out of the workers, all that stuff. And within Cato's work, we can get two big takeaways that give us insight into Roman beliefs and culture surrounding viticulture. The first is that Romans valued agriculture as the most esteemed and respectable of professions. Rich Romans could have put their money into industry or commerce or banking. Any of those could have made them money. But Cato makes it clear that agriculture is what you do if you want to be truly part of the most respectable class. The second big shift that we can see with Cato is a move away from subsistence farming towards cash cropping. Subsistence farming is when you grow some kind of basically everything you need. Some grain to eat, olives for oil, some grapes for wine, you raise some livestock for meat and milk, that sort of thing. You do a little bit of everything with subsistence farming. And this is really nice because it saves you a trip to the store. But it's not particularly efficient. If your land is best for growing olives, and you only dedicate 10% of your land to growing olives and the rest to other kind of crops, you're not really getting out of the most of the land, you're not getting the most out of the land that you have. Now, cash cropping is when you specialize in one thing, the one thing that your land is best for. And Cato mentions that during his time, in the middle of the second century BC, right after the Punic Wars, specializing in vineyards was a really good idea 
because of how much money you could make from the winemaking process, selling it within Italy and exporting it abroad. In the southern United States during the 19th century, the large farms where cash cropping took place were called plantations. Ancient Rome also saw the, the rise of large specialized farms during the second century BC, and we can see this in Cato's work. And these were known in Latin as latifundia. Just like plantations, latifundia tended to specialize in a single crop that brought in the most money. And just like plantations, they were often driven in large part by a slave labor force. And here it's useful to talk a little bit about what slavery, slavery was like in ancient Rome. Unlike in America, slavery in ancient Rome wasn't based on race. Rather, slaves could be anyone who was defeated in battle or bought and sold from another person. The division was far more about being Roman or not Roman rather than being black or white. And from the Punic Wars on, slaves were pouring into Italy because of the massive battles Rome was winning across the Mediterranean. And these slaves often ended up on Latifundia, farming and working on vineyards. And this had a major cultural impact. Not only did it increase the amount of wine flowing throughout Italy, it also caused the size of cities to swell. And this is kind of counterintuitive at, counterintuitive at first. So like how do slaves moving to the countryside actually make cities grow bigger? Well, first is that before these large scale latifundia, before they turned into these huge cash cropping farms, most of the countryside was populated by small scale subsistence farmers. But as these larger farms grew, smaller farmers were bought out. Basically, they could make more money selling their farm than they could actually farming. And then those people ended up moving into the cities. And the size of cities like Rome grew and grew and grew. And eventually, during the reign of Augustus, Rome was the biggest city in the world with approximately a million people a population that wouldn't be equal for about another 1,500 years. So we've talked now a little bit about kind of the types of farms that were used to produce grapes uh, and wine in the ancient Roman world, but let's step back for a moment and start at the very kind of beginning. So before we get our farm, our latifundia up and running, we need a place to set up shop where Roman, uh, like kind of where were Roman vineyards, both in the grand sense, right? Like where in the empire did they put these things? And then also in the specific sense. So like what sort of region or microclimate was good for growing grapes? In the early days of Roman viticulture, Roman people wanted to keep the substantial profits from winemaking all to themselves. So shortly after Cato the Elder wrote De Agricultura, Rome ended up legally banning the cultivation of vines north of the Alps. So you could no longer grow grapes in Germany or Switzerland or, uh, or France. And while you're missing out on a nice Bordeaux, what this did allow is for Rome to reap the monetary benefits of the export of wine to those regions. And it's said that the Gauls especially liked their wine, they drank a lot of it, and they drank it unmixed, so at a very, uh, very much higher kind of alcohol content um, than the, the Romans drinking wine in Rome. So, kind of like today, French still like their wine. This Rome-centric growing allowed Italians to export wine at a profit and then use that money to purchase more slaves so that they could grow more grapes, make more wine, and make more profit. You can see the cycle, right? They sell the wine, they buy slaves, the slaves help make more wine, they sell more wine, they buy more slaves, they sell more wine, uh, that sort of uh, kind of cycle moving forward. As Roman power expanded across the Mediterranean into Hispania, what we know as Spain, and beyond the Alps into Gaul, what we know as France, Roman military garrisons started to become permanent fixtures in regions beyond Italy. In addition to the garrison towns, Roman colonies were founded far and wide, and as Roman settlements began moving into the provinces, so did the production of wine. During the late Roman Republic and early Roman Empire, the expansion of Roman power led to grape growing and winemaking in most of the Old World areas that we now consider famous for their high quality wines. So Bordeaux and Burgundy and the Rhone Valley in France, uh, the Rioja region of Spain, the Moselle Valley in Germany, and this is all of course in addition to the Italian regions like Tuscany and the Veneto and Sicily that we consider famous for wine today. Eventually, Italy got so populated that the Emperor Domitian in 92 AD decreed it illegal to plant huge vineyards in Italy, instead forcing everyone to grow less profitable grain. Gotta feed your people. All in all, when we think about where Rome grew grapes for wine throughout the empire, one can say that A, it was just about everywhere, and B, they especially grew in areas we consider famous for wine today.
But what about location on a micro scale? So you've got a big old farm and you want to grow grapes. Where exactly are you going to do that? Well, the Roman authors were some of the first to document the preference for planting vineyards on slopes and hillsides rather than just on valley floors. And this isn't just so they could take aesthetically pleasing landscape photos for their Instagram account. The slopes help the vines because cold air runs downhill, and a little cool air is good for the grapes. But too much cool air is going to hinder the photosynthesis process. And so the slopes allow the cool air to pass through the vines, but then settle down on the valley floor below. So pretty smart ancient Roman dudes, not bad at all. Anyone who knows anything about wine in the modern world knows that it's all about location, location, location. Where grapes were grown regionally, what elevation, what temperature, how much precipitation. And if you've been paying attention to the past few slides, you can see how this might have been the case in antiquity as well, and indeed it was. So just like today, there were a variety of varietals. That's the term we use to denote the specific type of grape used in wine production. But kind of somewhat unlike today, there were also a variety of things that got mixed in with the wine. One of the most popular wines throughout the Roman Empire was known as mulsum, which was a normal grape wine that was mixed with honey just before it was drank, making it very kind of sweet. This was essentially the two-buck chuck of ancient Rome. It was wine given out to the plebs at big events, and it was a wine that plebs themselves would have served at their own kind of parties, and we have evidence of this uh, in ancient Roman texts. And if you think that mulsum sounds bad, Laura was even worse. Laura was a bitter kind of wine-like drink that was made from the leftover grape skins and stems after the initial winemaking process. So you go through the process, make all the good wine, and then all the junk that was kind of smashed up and had already been used once or twice or three times now gets used to make this stuff called Laura. And these would have then been left to ferment, and then kind of the rather unappealing beverage could be served to slaves or soldiers or the poor. Not all wine was so bad, though. In Italy, uh, regions of Latium, that's the area right around Rome, and Campania, the area kind of in the southern part of the country around Naples and Pompeii, were renowned as the greatest wine-growing regions of the, the era. About an hour south of Rome, a wine named Satinum was produced, and the author Pliny tells of how this type of wine became the favorite of the Emperor Augustus and future emperors. And the Roman Pope Marshall describes it as kind of a luxurious, sharp, and fiery, apparently tasting like figs. Now, everyone's heard the phrase, getting better with age, just like a fine wine. And it turns out that this too was a thing in antiquity. Some wines like Mulsum were meant to be drank pretty quickly within the year. But others, like the highly prized Kaikuban, this was like renowned as one of the kind of best wines ever, were supposed to be stored for many years. So Dioscorides says it tastes sweet, and Athenaeus tells it that it could only, uh, how it only reached its full kind of mature flavor after many, many years. Think of this as kind of an amazing Cabernet Sauvignon from a perfect vintage in Napa Valley. But the glorious kind of Kaikuban was not to last. The Emperor Nero eventually went tearing up the vineyards in search of a long lost treasure, and kind of the single Kaikuban vineyard that was so famous ended up falling into neglect and being destroyed by this. Now, despite Kaikuban's claim to the greatest wine in, ancient Roman, in the ancient Roman world, it was Falernian wine that received the most praise in ancient Roman literature. It was made from the Aminian grape. And the vines were said to have been brought to Italy by Greek colonists settling near Cumae in the south. Perhaps surprisingly, Falernian was both a red and white wine. And it was a fairly alcoholic one at that, just about 15%. Additionally, you had different varieties. It could be dry or sweet. And just like Caicuban, Falernian wine was thought to get better with age, sometimes aging for up to 20 years in a clay amphora, uh, the clay amphora used for storage in ancient Rome, which actually turned the wine kind of the white wine, kind of a weird amber or brown color. So think of that, white wine, being aged for 20 years, turning kind of amber or brown. It sounds kind of weird. Uh, one of the cool things about Flarnian wine is that there were different appellations. So even within this one type of grape, right, there were different um, geographic locations it was where it was grown. And these actually got their own name and had different kind of levels of desirability. So Calcinian wine was grown on the highest parts of the slopes of Mount Falernus. Regular kind of Falernian wine was grown towards the bottom of the slopes or on the valley floor. And Faustinian Falernian wine 
considered the best appellation of this varietal, was grown on the central part of the slopes of Mount Falernus. At Pompeii, we can see how Falernian stands out against other varietals. So some graffiti on the wall show the prices, in poetic form, of wine at a local bar. For one ass, think of, uh, you know, a buck or something like that, you can drink wine. For two, you can drink the best. For four, you can drink Falernian. So goes the little graffiti poem on the walls of Pompeii. And just like today, some vintages became legendary, like a 1787 Chateau Lafitte or an 1869 Chateau Margaux. The Opimian vintage of Falernian wine was so impressive that it was still talked about hundreds of years later. The name of the vintage came from the consul the year it was produced, Lucius Opimius, consul of 121 BC. And 200 years later, Pliny was still able to write about this vintage, saying that some families had stored it for centuries. The taste and texture left something to be desired, though, saying it was, quote-unquote, reduced to the consistency of honey with a rough flavor. Cicero agreed and called it barely drinkable. And we see in the Satyricon of Petronius that during the banquet of Trimalchio, he's trying to serve this, and he seems to have been duped into buying some fake Opimian vintage Falernian wine. Kind of interestingly, the, the change in texture and taste over the centuries seems to be what happens when French wines from the 18th century end up getting open today. It sounds equally as gross, even though people say it tastes good, uh, kind of because they spent hundreds of thousand dollars on it. So we've learned a little now about where grapes are grown and what grapes are grown, so now let's turn to the grape growing cycle. Since vines are something that produce fruit year after year, there isn't really a planting season like uh, you have with other crops. Now, once you planted them for the first time, you had to wait several, several years for the vines to mature and produce fruit. But after that, the vines would start growing and producing leaves and fruit in the spring, and then they were harvested in the fall. And during this time, we learned from the Roman agricultural writer Columella that the Romans also learned to start staking their vines, meaning that the vines grew up around wooden stakes, just like today, rather than around trees as had been previously done. And if you're ever interested in reading more about Columella, he'll also tell you how far apart to place your plants, about two paces apart, how many slaves to own for your land, and even what to feed your slaves for breakfast. Pretty weird. After the grapes were harvested, the winemaking process began by extracting the juices, called the must, from the inside of the grape by stomping on them. This was usually done by slaves. Stomping the grapes just got out some of the juices, though, and afterwards the grapes would be further pressed by an actual machine. There were two major types of wine presses in the ancient Roman world. The first was a beam press, described by Cato the Elder. With the beam press, grapes were placed between large beams, and then one end was twisted down using a rope or weighted down using weights, smashing the grapes in between the beams. The grape juice then spilled out into a series of shallowly sloped kind of graduated vats, with workers, again usually slaves, kind of separating the junk from the juice uh, as, its juice, as the juice made its way through those vats. The other type of press is known as a screw press, and was known from the ancient Greek world. In this type of press, a giant vertical screw went down into a stone basin, and at the bottom of that screw was a huge crushing stone that got pushed down as the screw was turned, thus basically accomplishing, accomplishing the same thing as the beam press. Regardless of the method of pressing, the grapes were usually pressed two or three times. And grapes were expensive, so they wanted to get everything out of them they could, right? Hence the lora, right? Even used from the grape skins and the grape, grape stems for the really, really low quality stuff. And as we saw earlier, there were different qualities of wine that could be derived from different amounts of pressing. The best wine could come out of the first press, the crappy stuff like the lora, right? Would come out of the last press. And even after all that was done, the grape skins would then be fed to livestock, truly using all the parts of the grape. And these were just two of the major press types. There were all sorts of variants on these as well. Lever presses with weights, lever drum presses, lever and screw presses, single fixed screw presses, and, and more and more and more. It's important to keep in mind, though, that it was likely that only the large latifundia, right, the large kind of plantation-style farms that used these presses, they were super expensive to build. Um, and so at smaller kind of family-run farms, they would have just stuck to getting, uh, using the stomping method to get the must out of the grapes. After the must was pressed, 
The wine then went into massive storage jars called dolia for fermentation. These were so large, holding up to thousands of liters, that they often needed to be buried in the ground. And here the yeast from the skin of the grapes would turn the sugars from the must of the grapes into alcohol, thus producing wine somewhere between 10 and 15% alcohol. After it reached around 15%, the fermentation process would stop. And this is where things start getting weird. Nowadays, we'd just put the wine in barrels and wait for it to age. But in ancient Rome, they'd often, but not always, do all kinds of weird stuff to the wine in order to improve taste or preservation. So sometimes they'd let the wine continue to ferment over the lees or the dead yeast, thinking that this improved the flavor. Other times, they'd take a portion of the must, the grape juice, right, and boil it to condense the sugars. And then they'd add that to the main part of the must to sweeten the wine, and they thought it made it last longer as well. And if they weren't boiling the wine to add sweetness, they were often adding something to it, right? Honey was a popular additive, as was lead, probably not a great idea. And sometimes a sweeter wine was just mixed with a less sweet wine. After a few weeks fermenting in the dolium, the wine was transferred into smaller amphorae for storage. An amphora was a ceramic storage vessel that most often held about 20 to 40 liters of liquid. These were basically the barrels of the ancient Roman world. And here the wine would age. Some wines, like Mulsum, were meant to be drank within months, maybe a year at most. Other wines, like Falernian, were supposed to age for at least 10 years, preferably 20, to get the most out of their flavor.